Hi guys, Sweden and Finland are ready to join NATO, and Russia has no objections. But Turkey and its dictatorial leader Erdogan is very unhappy and planning to block their membership because apparently Sweden and Finland harbors Kurdish terrorists who wants to destroy the sublime port. The media doesn't want to tell you the big picture, so in this video I will try to explain why Erdogan is Putin too. And Turkey being in NATO is a very dangerous game long term. All Turkish politics is basically a contest between two ideologies. One is colonial neo-Ottomanism and another is nationalistic. Both of these ideas have territorial expansion plans and demands to revise the Turkish borders which were established by the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923. Sooner or later, Turkey will do the same as Russia trying to do now with Ukraine. Here is why. Let's start from the imperial ambitions. From 1299 to 1922, there was no Turkey. Instead, you had the Ottoman Empire. The territory of its state was much larger and included a big chunk of Europe, which is modern Balkans, and pretty much all the Arabic-speaking Middle East. The biggest misconception about the Ottoman Empire is that this was an empire of Turks, which was a privileged nation and everyone else was a subject. Like, for example, the British Empire, where every subject can become part of the nation by adopting the language, the religion and the customs of the British. In the Ottoman Empire, there is no written Turkish language. Instead, the official language was Ottoman, which uh, is Turkish in principle, but 88% of the words there were of Arabic or Persian origin, making it completely unintelligible for the regular Turkish speaker. In the same time, the language of religion was Arabic, and the language of poetry and diplomacy was Persian. Also, a bunch of minority languages were popular, like Greek, Armenian, Bulgarian, and so on. Islam was a dominant and unifying religion, but Ottoman Empire tolerated Christians and Jews, allowing them to fully enjoy their rights, with a small exception that they have to pay higher taxes and they can't serve in army. The most weird thing in that story is about the ruling dynasty. Ottomans or Osmans. They were originally Turkish, but wanted to completely disavow that fact. The word Turk back then was basically a racial slur, meaning kind of a redneck Turkish speaker, and no one of the ruling class would ever call themselves like that. This is why they refused to speak Turkish and created the Ottoman language only for themselves. Culturally, Ottomans wanted to be part of the great European civilization, not descendants of Norman horse riders from Central Asia. They adopted a bunch of customs of the Byzantine Empire and after capturing Constantinople in 1453, the Ottoman Sultan declared himself an emperor of the Roman Empire. Just think about that for a second. The goal was to restore the empire in its former glory, making it Islamic with the capital in Rome. The Ottoman Empire slowly but surely was able to extend itself to the west, particularly to the territory of the modern Balkans. The sultans enjoyed European arts and invited the greatest painter of Italian Renaissance to make their portraits. The Ottomans tried to capture Italy twice, but managed to capture only a small town of Otranto for a very short period of time. Finally, with the death of Suleiman the Magnificent in 1563, and multiple military losses, Ottomans stopped their imperial ambitions and focused on developing their own territory. Here again, they didn't care much about the Turkish population in Anatolia, but focused their efforts in the European part of the empire, where the majority was non-Turkish and non-Muslim. I've had a two months long road trip across Turkey last year, and I can tell you there is very little Ottoman heritage. The situation is quite different in Europe, where dozens of towns like Plovdiv, Mostar, Sarajevo and obviously Istanbul with tons of amazing Ottoman architecture. You can even find Ottoman minarets as far as Eger in Hungary. In the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire became weak and started gradually lose its possession in Europe. The biggest loss happened after the Russo-Turkish War in 1887, where the heart of the empire Serbia, Montenegro, Bulgaria and Romania became independent and Bosnia got occupied by Austria. Just 16 years later, in 1913, after the Second Balkan War, the Ottoman Empire lost the rest of European land, with the exception of Eastern Trace and its capital Constantinople. The fall of the Ottoman Empire was just a question of time. In the same time, millions of Muslim Turks 
fled newly created Christian states and moved to Asian part of the empire. They started to think, maybe it's time to create a Turkish nation state. The problem was that the contemporary territory of Turkey was populated by different nations and 20-25% of them were Christians. These were Greeks who lived across the coast and in Cappadocia since the times of antiquity and Armenians who lived in the east and in all major cities. The largest Muslim non-Turkish nation were Kurds living in the east sharing the territory with Armenians. With the advent of capitalism, Christian population managed to adopt faster and became significantly richer, and Muslim populations still were pretty much medieval. All the big enterprises were disappropriately owned by Christians, which kind of violated the national order of the Muslim empire, creating a strong anti-Christian sentiment. You can compare that with Jews in Germany who got richer with capitalism as well, creating a similar anti-Jewish sentiment. How can you create Turkey for Turkish people in this harsh reality? What would be the final solution? Well, Christian population must be expelled or killed and Muslim non-Turk population must be Turkified. Pretty much the same what Hitler wanted to do in Poland. Jews are out, Polish Germanization. In 1914 the First World War started and it was an ideal time to commit a genocide and assume that every other country in the world would be too busy to intervene. The Armenian population was deported to Syrian deserts under the pretext that they were traitors and would collaborate with Russians who promised them an independent state. Instead of concentration camps, guest chambers and all that complex stuff, Armenians were just slaughtered on their way by government-sponsored paramilitary, with bodies being disposed in the nearby rivers. The author of the genocide, Talat Pasha, estimated in his memoirs that at least 600,000 of Armenians were killed. The modern estimates can be as high as 1.5 million though. Greeks were more lucky. Most of them were able to escape to Greece, but 300 to 900,000 were killed as well. There was also a third population of Assyrians. They were not too rich nor planning to collaborate with Russians, but they were confused with Armenians and killed as well. Currently, only 0.3% of the Turkish population are Christian, compared to 20-25% to back in 1913. Hitler would have been proud. And you might have a fair question, why was Nazi Germany punished for Holocaust and Turkey not? Well, at the end of the First World War in 1918, these genocides were only half the way, and Turkey actually lost the war. The Treaty of Serve was proposed by the Great Powers where independent Armenia was finally created on the east, Kurdistan was subject to plebiscite, Western Trace without Istanbul was transferred to Greece, and the Greek-speaking area near Smyrna was subject to plebiscite as well. All the Arabic-speaking Middle East became independent. Turkey disagreed and started the Turkish War of Independence, led by the greatest Turkish hero and nationalist, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. In 1919, he asked for the weapons from the communist Russia, telling them that evil capitalists were trying to subjugate the nation of Turks, promising that if he wins the war, Turkey will become another communist state. Lenin thought that it's better to abandon the Armenia project, let the Turks wipe out the rest of Armenians and at the end get the whole Turkey as a new Soviet Republic. The weapons were given. Armenia was recaptured and the genocide was completed. Greece lost the war against Atatürk as well and in 1923 there was a final exchange of the rest of the Greek Anatolian population in the ratio of three Greeks to one Turk. The West signed the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923, which defined the border of the modern Turkey. The most disgusting thing about the treaty is that it gives immunity to all the war crimes since 1914, efficiently wiping out Armenian, Greek and Assyrian genocide from the legal proceedings. Atatürk did not follow the promise to the Soviet Union and declared Turkey a capitalist state, becoming an absolute dictator. Aside of legal genocide, the guy was a true secular reformer. He made a Latin Turkish alphabet, promoted education, western way of dressing, banned hijabs in university, but only one language and identity was allowed, which was Turkish. The largest minority Kurds were not recognized and their language was banned for public use. 
There was no concept of surnames in Ottoman Empire and Ataturk introduced one. Everyone was able to pick up and use surname, but it must have sounded Turkish. For himself, he asked Turkish parliament for a special surname Ataturk, which means the father of Turks. Ataturk was not a big fan of Islam and he banned Arabic calls for prayer. Instead of screaming Allahu Akbar from the mosque, they had to use Turkish equivalent Tanri Udulur. That reform was too radical and was reversed back after 18 years. In the same way as Ottomans, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk didn't like the idea that original Turks were barbaric nomads from the Central Asia and he created Aryan-like theory that Turkish are descendants of Hittites, the great Bronze Age civilization in Anatolia which was a rival of ancient Egypt. And that was indeed a great civilization from 3000 years ago, but it had zero connections with Turks. 100 years ago, scientists were able to decipher Hittite languages and prove that it was Indo-European, but dictators are very selective about facts. Another crazy theory of Ataturk was that Native Americans are descendants of ancient Turks because of similarity in the language structures called agglutination. These theories are still alive and Erdogan believes in a modern version of that one, claiming that Turk seafarers colonized America before Columbus and that the first building which Columbus saw in Cuba was actually a mosque. Lastly, Ataturk was heavy drinker, who can drink half a liter of rakia per day, uh, which is a local vodka. Unsurprisingly, he died of cirrhosis of liver in 1938. Is it fair to compare Turkey to Nazi Germany? Ataturk predates Hitler rise by 15 years and he surely has nothing in common with that. Well, Adolf Hitler would disagree because he was inspired by Ataturk and said, Ataturk was the first to show that it is possible to mobilize and regenerate the resources that the country has lost. In this respect, Ataturk was a teacher Mussolini was his first and now his second student. Now you know the biggest secret that Holocaust was directly inspired by the Armenian genocide and the fact that Turkey was not punished for that at all. Okay, how is this related to modern Turkey? Well, if you go to any restaurants or hotels in Turkey, there is a 50% chance that you will see portrait of Ataturk. Usually there are a few of them in one place. And it's not done by the will of the government, just a very personal initiative. Young people are obsessed with the father of the nation as well. Just check Instagram profiles on the day of commemorating Ataturk's death. It's mind-blowing. Imagine if every second American diner had three portraits of Washington commemorating three different stages of his life, that his day of death would be a national grievance day and the time stops at exact minute of his death and all young zoomers are crying on TikTok posting Washington 1732 to infinity. There is a unique cult of dead dictator, which is a unique phenomenon. There are many countries with a cult of current dictators like North Korea, but propaganda is largely coming from the government. Here it's mainly a private initiative. It is quite scary considering that Turkey has never admitted any roles in the past genocides. And if you're ever in Ankara, you must go and see Ataturk's burial place, which is a colossal complex, aesthetically neoclassical Mussolini styles, and people all around Turkey are making pilgrimage there. It's quite a unique experience, and if you're a fan of dark tourism, go there. Anyway, after Ataturk's death, the policy of the country was to follow Ataturkism, continuing his policy of extreme Turkification. Kurdish, who were 20% of the population, were not that happy with that and with the financial support of the Soviet Union, the terrorist Kurdish Marxist PKK was created in 1978. Their goal was to establish an independent Kurdish state in eastern Turkey and they had to kill a bunch of innocent people. Local Kurdish population had to choose between two evils. One is the Turkish government and another is Kurdish Marxism. The situation changed in 2007 and anti-Ataturk and pro-Islam party won the election. Erdogan became the prime minister and later in 2014 a president. 
The state policy changed to Neo-Ottomanism, meaning that Turkey is a country of many nations and Islam back as a national idea. Erdogan's approach towards Kurds is completely different. They can speak their language, follow their unique cultural traditions and call themselves Kurds, but in the same time be very patriotic about Great Turkey, who is a leader in Muslim world and major regional player in the Middle East. Very similar ideology to the Russian one, which has many nations inside like Tatars or Chechens, but instead of independence and economic development, Russia offers them to be part of great empire, strong leader and pride for their ancestors. Both Russia and Turkey put great effort on religion as a base of social fabric. Now, what is the land basically in danger of being annexed by Turkey? In 1920, the last Ottoman parliament approved something like the land for the Turkish nation, and Ataturk fought for it in the upcoming war, but not everything was granted at the end. And here is the map. Notably, there is a huge chunk of the Syrian territory there. Well, in 2016, 2018 and 2019, Turkey made three special military operations to occupy a bunch of lands. The motivation of that move was to provide a safety buffer zone for Syrians so that refugees can come and stay there. It's total nonsense, but internationally nobody cares about Syria and most likely you have never heard that Turkey occupied northern Syria. Erdogan's very clear plan is to make these lands part of Turkey. Another place in the map is Iraqi Kurdistan. After the NATO war in Iraq, Turkey managed to establish 13 different military bases over there. You probably have never heard of that either. These guys are launching military strikes against people who they consider Kurdish terrorists pretty much every week. This is definitely the land Turkey wants to annex the most. There is a huge Turkish population which is being discriminated against from time to time. It's like Turkish Crimea. How this will be done is unclear, but there is absolutely no chance for independent Kurdistan there. Another place is Southern Georgia. A historical land where Turkish people lived before deportation of 100,000 of them in 1944 by Stalin. If Russia starts a full invasion of Georgia, be sure Turkey can come to the fist. Next one, Western Trace, which is part of current Greece, but 33% of people there are Turkish Muslims. Thessaloniki is the place where Ataturk was born. You got me. Finally, there is Cyprus, which is partially occupied by Turkey at the moment, but according to the doctrine, the whole Cyprus is the part of the sublime port. Also, there is an interesting country called Azerbaijan. Basically, Turkish and Azeri languages are extremely close to each other, closer than Ukrainian and Russian, and it's not part of Turkish land according to the map, but there is a very popular slogan in Turkey, one nation, two governments. Erdogan already helped Azerbaijan to regain the land in Nagorno-Karabakh, so why not to join these countries in one? In addition, Azerbaijan is not only the name of the country, but also the name of Iranian province. There are 15 million of Azerbaijani living in Iran. Taking that land would definitely be a jackpot for Erdogan, and nobody would object. There are also half a million of Turkish in Bulgaria and 300,000 more were expelled back in 1989, which is quite recent and as a result there is a very strong anti-Bulgarian sentiment in Turkey. Erdogan is way smarter than Putin and the level of dictatorship is not there yet, but it's going towards that direction. I don't believe that Turkey will attack Bulgaria, Greece or Cyprus in the foreseeable future, but annexation of Iraq Syria and Iran is something which can happen pretty much any moment. And it's not gonna be like Ukraine. Nobody cares about these countries. Nobody will go and protest in case of invasion. And one unpunished crime always leads to a much bigger one. Thanks for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe and see you next time!